we'll see. We'll see, and I hope we can, but we're going to see what happens as we move forward. I was at a buffet. I go to a lot of buffets going through the line. There's a guy in front of me the other day, and he had two plates of food. The guy, he was, but he was heaping up a third plate of food, and the guy next to him said, you're not going to live very long eating like that. He said, well, I don't know. Uh, my granddad lived to be 105, and he said, well, I bet your granddad didn't live to be 105 eating like that. And he said, well, no, he lived to be 105 by minding his own business. <laughs> Uh, we kind of wish our government were minding its own business. And one of the reasons why is because government doesn't do anything very well. We have to have government. All of us here believe in government. But, you know, Jefferson said that government is a necessary evil. You know, what did he mean by that? You have to give up a little liberty to live in civilization and to have government. You have taxes, you give up a little bit of your labor. But it's a necessary evil because we realize we're giving up some of our liberty and some of our labor to have government. But that's why we should always minimize it. It's also why Jefferson said government is best that governs least. And then there's just the practical argument that government doesn't do anything very well. They're, they're ineffective. I say that it's not that government is inherently stupid, although that's a debate. <laughs> <laughs> they just they don't get the same messages. You in business or whatever you do for your living, you have to beat a payroll, you've got to make a profit. You have to be efficient, not because you want to be, because the marketplace forces efficiencies. Things are distributed efficiently because of the marketplace. You know, that's why we have to be proud of that system. If we don't understand that system or if we don't think that you did build that when you build a business or we think somehow you know, that the roads created the business instead of the other way around, <laughs> we misunderstand America and we misunderstand what's made America great. Now, some of the Ron Paul people have been disappointed. I know there were a lot of delegates here, and you guys did great in Iowa and are probably happy with the process for the most part. Some states, they didn't get seated, and they're, some of them are unhappy. And I say to them, look, politics is messy. You can look at it two ways. Some would say, and there is some point to this, Ron Paul got a very small percentage of vote, but got a much larger percentage of delegates because they worked hard and they got through the system. You could argue they had a disproportionate influence here. I'm not arguing we had too much influence, but you can look at it both ways. We also did make some compromises, and the campaign was part of some of these. The Maine delegation got split, even though I think we won Maine fair and square. But in the end, we didn't win the nomination, so really it's about participating. It's about being here. It's about making the platform better, as we think it is. I think we've got a lot of good things in the platform. All of the Fed is in the platform. And I'll yes. just a lot of particularly just Ron Paul people or the crowd, every Republican in the House voted for audit the Fed. I think mean, one Republican did and 100 Democrats voted for it. So now we're in the Senate, and uh, Chuck, you're going to have to help me very read. I've been to talk to him twice, and I've sat down with him. We even found that video footage. We were part of taking that video footage out there. In 1995, we have about six or seven minutes of on the floor saying that he's all He's been for audit the Fed, and we have to audit the Fed, and he's been for it, I think he says in his speech, since 1987. Problem is, he's not sure he's still for it. <laughs> but it's yeah. passed in the House. This is the time to get the vote. It's harder to get votes in the Senate, but if everybody in the room who's interested in it will talk to your friends, and everybody emails everybody in a nice, polite fashion, and say, hey, please give us a vote on audit the Fed, we might get it. I've been talking with him, and I'm sort of in his way on several other issues that I've been willing to get out of his way. And that's what, there is some give and take and some compromise up there. And the compromise is, I will give up something I care more about to get, you know, less about to get something I care more about. That's right. And so I'll get out of his way and he'll let us have his vote. I don't know that we're gonna get that deal, but we're doing all of that behind the scenes. If you will email Harry, maybe we get a vote on it. Um, unfortunately, it's not the only thing I'm trying to get a vote on. Uh, there's the doctor in Pakistan who's being held for the rest of his life who helped us get Bin Laden. I've said, look, why keep sending money to an ally that doesn't act like an ally? So I've said no more money to Pakistan unless he's released. And I believe Senator Grassley is helping me with that effort also, isn't that right? Yes, good. A couple of you already have. Maybe we all want to 
it is an issue that I think it's important that if you want to be an ally of our country, we do need allies. We need we need people around the world we work with, but you need to act like an ally. And right now, imprisoning the guy who helped us get Bin Laden is not acting like an ally. Now, some get unhappy at the proceedings and say, oh, I'm not being treated fairly. I'm just going to take my toys and go home. I don't think that's the best way to do it. I think the best way is to participate within the Republican Party, whether you're always getting what you want or not. If you're an adult, you don't always win every time. You've got to realize that. Stay in the party. Make the party bigger and stronger. When I, uh, after the 2000, or during the 2008 election, I went, and I wasn't running for office. I was active in my community, but I wasn't overly active. I went to the county convention or the district convention as a delegate for my father. Well, there was the McCain panel in mine, and ours, they wouldn't even let me speak, which I was a little bit mad about, because I wanted to speak even though we were going to leave, lose, speak for our, our nominating panel. But instead of going home, I just decided to run for office. I mean, I just, you know. <laughs> Uh, in Iowa, a lot of new people have gotten involved in the Republican Party. You need a bigger party. We need a bigger party everywhere. It's part of what I'm going to continue talking about with the National Republican Party is that there are places we cannot win anymore. We're not winning in California. We can spend, uh, I think one candidate spent $100 million and didn't win. We're not winning in New England anymore. We start out the presidential election down 10 or 15 states and just give up. We're 150 electoral votes behind. That's why we have to win Florida. We have to win Ohio. But if you get down to the point where you always have to win certain states and you're not competitive in all the states, maybe we ought to think that we might need a little bit different kind of Republican to run in like California or a little different kind of Republican to run in New England. Some of that might be a more constitutional foreign policy, maybe a less aggressive foreign policy, maybe a more restrained foreign policy, maybe a foreign policy that says, you know what? If we have to go to war, it's it's sort of a failure and a breakdown of everything that we should be doing. But if we have to go to war, war should be declared by Congress and not by the president. <laughs> and I think these are two separate issues. There there is the issue of how you go to war, the constitutional process of going to war, or hopefully not going to war. And then the other part of the process is, is war in our national interest? Is it in our vital interest? They're really, to me, two separate debates. So what I work hard in Washington is to try to convince as many of my colleagues that it's important the separation of powers, that the power, you know, Madison said that the legislative branch got that power because he was worried the executive, or the king back in the old days, was more prone to go to war. So our founding fathers gave that power and separated the power. The president is the commander in chief, but Congress is supposed to have significant influence and power and hopefully debate over whether we go to war. But that we should get all Republicans to agree to on whether we go to war. We may not always agree when we get to is war in a certain area of the world in our vital interest or in our national interest, but then we should have a full and healthy and spirited debate. I don't always win everything up there. I lose a lot. I probably lose a lot more than I win. But there are a couple times that I have won, and I'm proud of it. On uh, the Iranian sanctions bill, I had them add two lines. And the two lines basically said, or maybe one said, it said, nothing in this bill is to convey or be construed as a declaration of war. People say, oh, well, we're not declaring war. That's not what we're talking about. You're crazy. Well, as the words become more and more bellicose, what happens is someone comes into power as the president says, the bombs dropped yesterday on Iran, and this resolution said that all these things about Iran. Well, I wanted it to be clear that we are saying that we don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, but we're not saying we have declared war, and we haven't had that debate yet. And that's a separate debate that will come at some time, and I tell people it's the most important debate we ever had. It's not that we never go to war, but the debate is so important that I look at it as if my 19-year-old's going to war. When I've been out to Walter Sorry. Reed and seen the kids, they look younger than my 19-year-old. who are missing limbs and they're brave young men that volunteer for the country. But it's an important decision. It should not be taken frivolously whether we send them to war. And it's important that it's constitutional, that it's important that we have an important debate over whether or not it is in our vital interest. did fight and we did win was over whether or not an American citizen accused of terrorism 
found innocent by a jury of the peers could still be held indefinitely. So it sounds kind of bizarre that anyone would think that that could be in our country. We're talking about accused of a crime, found innocent by a jury of the peers, and then sent to Guantanamo Bay for the rest of life. That sounds absurd. We had that vote. I was a we had that vote though and we won that vote and uh, the reason why it's important and why we keep talking about this whole idea of indefinite detention and whether you're a citizen whether you're not what are the rights of being a citizen what is due process many in our caucus think that due process is having a habeas here a habeas is, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, but habeas corpus, it's present the body, as I understand it. You were held many times by a king who would just put you away and they never have to present you with charges. Never have to have a judge make a decision on are the charges valid. And some people are kept. You know, they're kept without bail until they're tried. But you had to present the body, you got a jury, you got a lawyer, present your case. Some people think that's all of due process. So they think that if you get a habeas hearing, everything's fine. We're not talking about American citizens accused of something in our country. And what are some of the characteristics that might make you a terrorist or might you, make you suspicious? The Department of Justice has a list of these. Stains on your clothing, missing fingers. Anybody know a farmer in Iowa that's missing a finger? Yeah. We, have, we have a senator who's missing fingers. That's a characteristic of, of possibly being a terrorist. Buying things with cash, buying weatherized ammunition, um, you know, all of these things can be fairly innocent as well as, you know, having storing food, you know, I mean, is it a crime to store food in your basement? Uh, you know, in, fa in fact, if you look on the government website, the government website says that you should store food in case of a tornado, a hurricane, or anything else. Yeah. But then on another website says if you're storing food, you might be a terrorist. <laughs> so you have to be careful what we're talking about. And if you, an American citizen, get accused of that, just having a habeas hearing isn't due process. There is also representation by an attorney, which is also in the Bill of Rights. There's also a trial by jury. I mean, a trial by jury is very important, and a lot of people within our caucus and within Congress think a habeas hearing is enough. It's not enough. You have to have a jury trial to, to complete the process of what due, what, what due process should be, and that's something we will continue to fight but I think the best way to fight it is not by hitting people over the head, it's by continuing to have a polite conversation and you get people to come your way. There are many people who have come our way on that issue, but it is an important issue. Coming up the world, the world is If we are fortunate enough to win, there will be talk of a budget. Everybody says, well, the Democrats or the Pitts, because they haven't had a budget in three years. I agree. But that's not to me, a, 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 an exhortation that we pass anybody. Oh, we're in charge now, we have to pass anybody. You know, I think we should work hard, deliberate, have a budget that comes out, but I'm not gonna vote for any budget. Whether it's a Republican or Democrat budget, it has to balance in a finite period of time. So what I mean by a finite period of time is and I'm willing to negotiate, and I am willing to compromise within a couple of years, give or take. But the balanced budget amendment says that we balance in five years, and that will be the law if we pass it. All 47 senators support a balanced budget amendment. I think going much beyond five years, you're not serious about it. It might take two or three years to ratify a constitutional amendment, so you could conceivably say that could be eight years. That's getting virtually to my limit. I'm just announcing it because if the Republicans get mad at me for not voting for their budget, I'm letting them know. Why don't I want to vote for one that balances at 28 years? It'll never happen. That's right. The other thing is, is we present what we want, and then the other side's going to have to make us compromise. So if we're starting with 28 years, and President Obama's starting with infinity, <laughs> between 28 years and infinity is not a very good compromise. If we started with five years and the Democrats want 20 year years or 12 years and we get to eight or 10 years, then we're talking about a realistic compromise. You can't bind future Congresses. You can't bind future presidents. So to say we're gonna balance it in the future by locking in these uh, gradual spending cuts over time isn't the way to go. 
The other reason why, and the reason why I haven't supported several Republican proposals for long periods of time to balance the budget is, if it doesn't eliminate some part of government, if it doesn't get rid of some of big government, That's right. that everybody in this room is for getting rid of, if you're just adjusting the dial from going up at 7.5% yep. to say we're still going to go up at 5%, have we really gotten anything? Is it worth coming all the way down here if we don't eliminate some part of big right. right. I don't think <laughs> I think we should get rid of certain departments. It makes it a lot easier to balance the budget. It makes it a lot easier to keep us within balance. We just say certain things shouldn't be done in Washington. From 1980 to 2000, it was in our platform. We didn't believe in the Department of Education. We didn't believe in a federal role for a state. There's a lot of frivolous stuff in the Department of Energy. You know, there's $30 billion worth of loans. Who are they going to? They're going to very wealthy people who are contributors to the president. Solyndra, the 20th richest man in the world, got $500 million of your money, and it's gone. The Kennedy family have a company, Robert Kennedy's got a company called Bright Source. They got 1.8 billion. And I'm not a big businessman, but his gross revenue the year before was 13 million. And do you think a bank is gonna give you a billion dollar loan on 13 million dollars worth of sales? They got it because they're contributors and they're friends of the president and it shouldn't happen that way. But you know what they tell me when they say that? I say, oh well, Republicans have always been for these loans. Well, we've been wrong before, and we need to change that as well. <laughs> so, Department of Energy, there are things that we need. We have to have some nuclear control over nuclear power, nuclear weapons, things like that. I think it's mostly nuclear power under the Department of Energy. So, like, when I say get rid of the Department of Energy, I say, well, yeah, we'll keep 5 or 10% of it and put it in another department. But if you can eliminate entire departments, you lower your baseline significantly and you can get to balance. But I will tell you, the numbers are tricky. When they tell you they're going to cut, you have to look second at what they're saying. The baseline's going up about $9 trillion over 10 years. So when they say, oh, the least is $4 trillion, yeah, I agree, the least is $4 trillion you ought to cut. But that would still be adding $5 trillion over 10 years. I don't think that's enough. If you were to freeze spending, Let's say we froze spending for 10 years, you basically balance the budget within about 10 years by freezing. So when they say the cuts would have to be so draconian, they're not being honest with you, unless a cut is from cutting the rate of growth, you know, of proposed growth. Freezing the budget would, cut, would balance about 10. If you do the penny plan that Connie Mack started in the House and I'm promoting in the Senate, that's cutting 1% real cut each year for six years, it balances somewhere between six and eight years by cutting 1%. We need to talk in those terms. But a freeze they consider to be a $9 trillion cut. So you can see how the semantics of the argument and numbers are kind of crazy. We have to do something about it. The one good thing we have, or the most important thing you have to remember out of all of this, is that the engine of capitalism is enormously successful. We, we defeated socialism because the engine of capitalism defeated the engine of socialism. It doesn't work. But capitalism works in an incredible fashion. And it's not about accumulating you know, more money for you or more money for your pockets. There's nothing wrong with that and being successful and having things for your family and working hard because you want to have things for your family. But there's also the ancillary benefit that the most humanitarian society, the most charitable society is a wealthy society. You know, so private money flows all around the world, not just government money. We sent $3 billion worth of private money after the tsunami in Southeast Asia from churches and volunteers. We're an incredibly generous society. We sent a couple of billion dollars to the Gulf Coast after Katrina. We sent nearly a billion dollars to Haiti. I bet you there are people in this room who have either been to Haiti or the Dominican Republic or places on mission trips. We're an incredibly generous society. We can continue to do that if we're proud of our system, if we keep the government out of our economic affairs, allow our system to thrive, pay attention to our founding documents, be proud of our country, be proud of what we stand for, believe in ourselves, believe in our economic system again, we can thrive. There's still an enormous amount of wealth in this country, but it's sitting there and it's afraid. I just finished reading a book uh, by Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man about the Great Depression, and in that she talks about how business at the time was terrified of the president 
business was sitting on the sidelines. Business wouldn't invest because they were so afraid of president. Everything she wrote about FDR could be written about this president. Business is terrified of him because they don't know what he's going to do to him next. If we can change, if we can get a new president, if we can unleash this enormous amount of wealth we have in our country, we will thrive again. I hope you're part of it. I hope you will remain part of it. And I hope you help and help me to get some reinforcements out there. Thank you very much.